A gaffe is when a politician tells the truth. Michael Kinsley, American political journalist and commentator. All right, welcome to another episode of the Liberty Dad podcast, a discussion on politics and culture. If you're tuning in, I want to especially thank you for giving me your time. It is election season, and that means candidate interviews. Normally, I only interview candidates running as a libertarian. That's because I, on the side, am the chair of the Libertarian Party here in Jacksonville, Florida. And to ensure there's no question about my dedication to the role, I avoid interviewing candidates from other parties. However, today's candidate is a bit different because they are running in my district. And this particular race does not have somebody running for the Libertarian Party to interview. Therefore, I have decided to make an exception here. To keep things fair, I will be reaching out to her Republican and Democratic challengers to offer the same opportunity. I'll let you know. Please give a welcome to Mara Macy, who is running for U.S. Congress here in Florida District 5. Mara, how are you? I'm well, DL. How are you? Doing very well. So we are pre-recording this, folks. So just so you know, if you throw something in the comment, we're not going to respond to it. Probably wasn't a good comment anyway. Just kidding, folks. Just kidding. All right, let's get into this. Mara, you are running for U.S. Congress District 5. Let's let's just kind of start right out the gate. What motivated you to run? And this will actually be your second time running. So what yes. motivated you the first time and then said, you know what? I love politics so much and I love the game of politics that I'm going to do this a second time. Yeah. I don't know if that's how it went to you, but, <laughs> but the first time around uh, what motivated me was the fact that my husband who is active duty Navy was in a lawsuit with the DOD over the shop mandate. He had uh, told the Navy after 18 years of active duty service and three years of reserve service that he was not under no circumstances going to be taking the COVID shot. And uh, that led us to a point where we had to make decisions about our family uh -huh. and our future. And we realized that when we reach out to Congress across the country, throughout the whole community that was refusing it within the military, we couldn't get anybody Senate side or house side to actually do anything for us. So it, it got me looking into John. I found out John had told two families there was nothing he could do for them. He had told two other families nothing at all. He just didn't respond. So it got me looking into John further. And then I saw how horrible his voting record was for what I believe in. And I said, this guy needs a challenger. And that motivated me to go into the race in 22. Now, come around in October 23, and he opens his mouth about the speakership, which I'm sure you libertarians understand was a big deal amongst the Republicans. And a lot of Republicans were very angry with the fact that Rutherford did not support Jim Jordan. And then he opens his mouth about Matt Gates. He's trying to punish Matt Gates, and, and it just did not sit well with Republicans across the country. So my phone started ringing and people started saying to me, hey, you told us that if there isn't a, a better opponent again this time around, that you would get into the race. And I realized that, you know, as someone with integrity, I absolutely did say that and I meant it. So I got back into the race because we do need representation here that um, that has some form of integrity and some ethics. Gotcha. And let's take a look. So I, I you, you mentioned that you started running uh, or you first ran in 2022. So I'm going to bring up those results. And this is, of course, not to embarrass people. We just want to have a conversation about things and let people know, you know, hey, that was then. This is now. And let's have a conversation about that. So let me go ahead and pull up. Um, and this would be the Republican primary results uh, from that time. So putting that up on the screen here, and we have John Rutherford, who ran um, in 2022. You ran uh, also. And then I'm probably not going to get the name right, but Leah Garner Lopez also ran as well. And it looks like you took second place. So John Rutherford won. So my question to you is two things, actually. What is the best thing that you did in that race? And then what would what would you or are you doing different in this race this time around? 
Now, that's a great question. I think the the best thing I did was I was out every day at a different event or I was door knocking. I was getting myself known throughout the community, throughout the district. However, there are still a lot of skeptical people, especially since I'm originally from Massachusetts. So mm -hmm. you have the people down here who have seen an influx of Northeasterners that moved to Florida and they're afraid that the, those people are going to move the needle more towards the Democrat party. So there was a lot of mistrust there and mm -hmm. people weren't sure how to gauge me because they didn't know me, but they got to know me throughout the f last few years. So I have a lot more people behind me this time. Although that time, I, I honestly think that 23 and a half thousand votes is pretty decent for being in the race for only three months. Mm -hmm. The other woman in that race, she actually goes by Luna, even though her given name is Leah. She was in that okay. race pretty much the full two years. And, um, and I, and I hate to play demographics, but the fact is that in that race in particular, it was an open primary, meaning that everybody could vote in it. So not just Republicans. And mm -hmm. if we take that and break it down between who did vote in it in terms of Republican, Democrat, or everything in between, we see that a lot of those Democrats actually ended up voting for John. So this time around, we have a closed race and those Democrats can't vote for John. If they were to have chosen a woman over John because they're a Democrat and sometimes they like to favor the females, they think we have too many old white men in office and maybe it's mm -hmm. true. But uh, if they were to do that, I tend to believe that a lot of them are going to go full on based on a name opposed to a face or an actual ideology. And they probably would have still voted for Luna because A, she had been in the race longer and B, her last name is Lopez. They, these people that um, tend to vote Democrat are more likely to pick things based on those demographics. Oh, it's a woman. Oh, she's not white. Mm -hmm. Like these things actually go through the heads of some voters. And I don't think those things went through the head of my voters. I think my Got voters it. are generally people who want freedom and believe in the constitution. Right. And we're, and we're seeing that now with the, the current democratic pick, um, Kamala Harris, there's a lot of conversation about, uh, you know, her being a woman and then also her being a black or Indian woman, depending on who's having that conversation. So we do see that and we're actively seeing it at this time. Now, what I think is interesting is you, you mentioned a couple things that kind of stood out to me. You said you got a call that people are, uh, that people were interested in having you run. Um, and then what I did notice is that this time around, there are only two of you in the Republican primary which means the 22,000 votes that she got, which again, might some of them might be Democrats and some of his might be Democrats and whatnot. Um, but aside from that, just looking at the numbers as we can see them, uh, you would get you know any of the additional votes that would that might be split from an, a third Republican challenger. And then, of course, uh, one of the things that you had mentioned was, hey, people called me and then two, um, was the other thing <laughs> I had it on the tip of my tongue there, but I have forgotten it. So I apologize, but effectively it looks like you will be able to, um, uh, put that put forward, a, uh, an even stronger, um, contest against, uh, Mr. Rutherford this go around. So, uh, how are you feeling at this present moment, uh, in, in terms of this primary, are you feeling like really strong? Or are you like, well, you know, I think I'm doing well, uh, but I still got a lot of doors to hit or or kind of like, where are you feeling at this moment? Yeah, no, I feel really strongly about the support that we already have, but always mm -hmm. there will always be more doors to hit because fact is, is you have high propensity, low information voters. Mm -hmm. If we had high propensity, high information voters, we wouldn't have to worry about these things. But the thing is, is a lot of people think they know who they're voting for or what they're voting for. And so they go and vote every single cycle, but they're not actually vetting their candidates. They're not actually looking into their alternatives. They're just seeing an ad on the television or looking at a mailer that they get in their mailbox. And they're just saying, well, this must be the person from my party that has the support because I'm holding this thing in my hand. And the fact is, is that is an outdated way of thinking. 
we know now, as um, it has been exposed many times over the past course of the past three years, even here in Duval, is that people with flyers are getting the money from that from dark money packs and mm -hmm. that special interests fund those dark money packs, not people, not regular U.S. citizens. I get donations for about five dollars to up to a, a few thousand, depending on who it is. But most of my donations are under $200. So I'm being funded by the people. My name is definitely out there. But I will never say that we've hit enough doors. We have to gotcha. hit every door we can. Gotcha. And, and uh, you know, I, I just want to make sure that people don't realize that's what I was aiming for. I just kind of misworded my question a little bit there. Um, so you there, so there are, so it, ultimately there are three people that look like they are running right now for Florida district five. There's you, there's John Rutherford, and then there's Jay McGovern. Um, what's your feeling about the democratic challenger? Well, I believe Nikki Freed said that she wanted a democratic challenger in every single race in Florida. I don't take him seriously. This is a plus 12 Republican district, and he's really not making a presence for himself at all. You would think at this point, he would at least be trying to get his name out there in some way, shape or form. I, I just don't take him as a serious competitor. I think it's just a, a matter of making sure there's a Democrat in every race. And honestly, he couldn't be more opposite from what he has put out on social media. He couldn't be more opposite than the things that I believe in. So it's it's really it's the truth of a general election is when you get to a general election, you tend to be voting for a letter, not a candidate. So mm -hmm. if they want a Democrat, they're going to vote for Jay. And if they want a Republican, they're going to vote for me. Gotcha. And in this particular district, I'm going to show a little bit of ignorance here. Um, is it does it tend to lean Republican? So my district does. I know not all all districts throughout Duval do because we do have, actually, we have more Democrats registered than Republicans, not to say they turn out at the same rate. They don't. Republicans turn out at a higher rate than the Democrats do. But we have some very, if you look at school board or you look at city council, we have some very stronghold Democrat areas. Now, Duval is still going to go red overall. However, when you add in St. John's, mm -hmm. you're going to end up getting plus 12. So gotcha. it, it, my district is, is a, it's, it's pretty strong red. Okay. Gotcha. And just for the record, I'm going to put it up on the screen here. This is the, the district according to, I believe it was um, Wikipedia or maybe Google maps um, that I was able to pull up. So it does include um, the Eastern portion of Jacksonville all the way out to the beach and then all the way down to St. Augustine. So this would be the district uh, district five that we're talking about just in case anybody's watching it and are unfamiliar with exactly the scope of it. Um, so let me, put, let me get you back here. Okay. So when I, when I bring up the three, the interesting thing is one of the things that I love doing, which is maybe a little bit weird. I like going to the FEC and just kind of seeing, okay, what kind of donations are coming in? Now we know that Republicans and Democrats, normally what I'm used to is comparing my libertarian peers to Republicans and Democrats since I don't typically interview either Republicans or Democrats. But in this case, it's a little bit different. So, but I noticed something interesting, like he still has a large amount of money coming in. So he's got about $612,000 that he has raised so far. Jay McGovern um, has raised 27,000 and you've actually almost doubled uh, what Jay McGovern has with $55,000. So let me ask you, because I'm always curious about this with this, with such a disparity in money, what is your plan to compete against? And we don't have to worry about Jay so much since you have twice as much, but what is your plan to compete with Rutherford's money that he has uh, so that you can secure a win? Most of it is door knocking. And really it is targeting those voters, the super voters, the high propensity voters. And mm -hmm. some of them have already heard of me and some of them ask if they can give me a hug because they don't know about me. But once they find out I'm running against John, they are so excited that there is another candidate that they can vote for. The Republicans here are not happy with him. I mean, unless you take the, what I call loyalist, the John mm -hmm. Rutherford loyalist, the people that John Rutherford could murder a man and they would still vote for John. I mean, these people have, I've been in a position where I was at a polling location and the one guy tried to intimidate me. Now, again, I'm originally from Massachusetts. I'm not easily intimidated, 
but I had to hold back because I am a candidate. Mm -hmm. It's just funny because these people who, listen, I've had people who are friends with John Rutherford. I had a woman in St. Augustine tell me she's been friends with John for 25 years. She said, but I'm voting for you. He's just not doing what we need him to do. I've had several people tell me they've worked with him. They're friends with him. They like him. They still text him, all these things, but they're voting for me. The way I see this is if I can turn one of every three to four Rutherford voters from 22 to vote for me, then I'm going to win this thing. So that's the, that is really the challenge is getting that person to turn. So I got to be knocking doors and volunteers have to be knocking doors with me because I'm one person in a district that's going to have a hundred thousand votes in this primary. Got it. Um, so I want to, are there, does, is there anything about John's record that stands out to you um, that you want to say like, Hey, look, he voted this way and here's how I would have voted and why. Sure. I mean, one of the most recent votes that uh, really irked me was his extension of FISA. And that irks me because he was the, everybody technically was the one vote, right? But that passed, that extension of FISA, warrantless spying, mm -hmm. that passed with one vote. So if I had won in 2022, it wouldn't have passed. So I'm against FISA altogether, not just one section, altogether. It is, it's not constitutional. End of story. There is no debate there. And um, that is just one particular vote that just comes to mind really easily just because it is the one vote and it is so unconstitutional. But the other thing is, is he's voted for every single continuing resolution. He votes to send money to Ukraine, all of it. There is not one Ukraine deal that he has not sent. So all the billions that have gone to Ukraine, he's all for. I'm not. I'm not for funding foreign wars. I, yeah. I'm in a military family. I actually look back on the wars that I thought I had supported back when I was a younger person. And I realize at this point, if our government is willing to lie to us about X, Y, and Z, then what means that they weren't lying to us about the, the reason we got into these wars? Who's to say that we're not partially responsible for the reason that we got into these wars? So I'm not really, I'm not a warmonger. I do believe that we, we are good and we think we have good intentions, but we shouldn't be involved. Our founding fathers never intended for us to be involved in conflicts that did not directly affect our nation or our security. So I don't see a reason why we should be uh, funding both sides of every war out there. And I don't see a reason why we should be putting our troops on the ground in countries for wars that are not ours. So right. those are things that he funds and that I'm not for. And and that's another part of his voting record. Right. And and that would be something that libertarians would be, that would appeal to libertarians as well. The fact that you would have, uh, th that you wouldn't have supported these kind of things because we oppose war, we oppose funding other people's war. In fact, our general stance is, hey, it's your war. You figure this out. We we have no obligation to come and help you. Um, and then we would off, we often go further and we say, when we do come and help, we actually make things even worse. Uh, and, and, and so there's actually repercussions and blowback that we have to deal with. So that would, unfortunately, we have a closed primary. So you're not going to be able to get any libertarian votes against him. However, that would appeal to libertarians to potentially vote for you should you win the primary when it comes time for the general election. All right, so I want to uh, I want to go through some of your positions and and maybe we can just start and say what is your like what is your top maybe one or two issues when you're talking to voters and you're like here's why you want to vote for me. What is like I mean I'm not not necessarily like I'm going to be better and vote better than John Rutherford but going forward just looking at some of the issues, what are what are one of the you know the top maybe one or two issues that you that you talk to voters about and they find appealing? Well, I always say, and it doesn't actually. The voters always want something more specific because mm -hmm. what I always say is that my biggest issue with government and the number one thing that I want to deal with is mm -hmm. government corruption. And I okay. believe that we need more transparency and more accountability in government. Now, that doesn't tickle people's fancy because they want to hear the big issues. They want to hear you talk about abortion or they want to hear you talk about um, DEI or all these other things. But the problem is, is we can't address any issues truly when we have such a corrupt government 
if we don't deal with the corruption. So we're not going to get to the bottom of anything. We're not going to fix any of our problems if we still have corruption so deeply embedded in our system because the corruption is what drives the wars. It's what drives the it, the immigration. It's what drives mm-hmm. everything. There is always another reason that they're not telling us. So corruption is my biggest issue, but I also feel that in order to expose the corruption, I need to be transparent when I get there. If I'm trying to support a bill or, or if someone's trying to bribe me, I need to tell the people. I feel like that's what's missing. We don't understand why our representatives vote the way they vote. And I think a lot of it is because they don't want to tell on their colleagues and say, well, this person said they won't vote for this if I don't vote for that. Well, you know what? We need to tell because the people are angry. We want to know why we're not getting our uh, issues or bills passed and and we don't understand what's going on behind the scenes. So I believe exposing what's going on behind the scenes is is what I'm going to be doing up there. But in terms of if I if I had to give you an actual issue issue, I have a few things that really do matter to me. And one of them is making the government smaller on the federal level. I think all these mm-hmm. alphabet agencies are unconstitutional. And I think a lot of the power needs to be returned to the states. I believe that the government is taking our tax dollars and funding things that are unconstitutional. And if we are going to be taxed, then those taxes should be done at a higher level statewide, not federal. Federal Mm -hmm. government has enumerated powers and we're not supposed to be doing all the things that we're doing. So I want to uh, minimize the government. I want to make it smaller. I want to cut out a lot of these uh, agencies, starting with the Department of Education. Right there, that the Department of Education has failed our children. It's failed our culture. It's failed our society. So, so that is one of the bigger things that I I talk about is getting rid of the alphabet agencies, as I call them. When you talk to voters, what's their reception when you when you're talking about these kind of things? Do they do they do they come to it kind of more in a like thoughtful way, or are they getting excited about it, uh, you know, kind of like, give, give me the vibe that you're getting when you talk to, to voters. Well, particularly when I talk about the Department of Education, I get rounds of applause every single time, every time. And, uh, you know, I often, some people from the crowd will throw out, what about this department or what about that? And I'm like, basically all of them, all of them, right. if they were not constitutional to begin with, why are we pretending we have a document that we love and we follow and it's still alive and all the, we talk about it constantly as if we follow it. I mean, but come on, read it. It's not that long. It doesn't take that much time out of your life. Read it and tell me that we're following that document. So a, a lot of people are catching on. They are saying, you're right. We are not, we're not following our own constitution. And if we're not following our constitution, what are we following? I get, I get very good reactions to the fact that, we need to go back to the constitution. Got it. You know, as a libertarian, that's very appealing to me. Um, you know, and I know a lot of my libertarian peers out there might say, Hey, you know, like they, they may quibble with the constitution, but one of the things that I point out to some of them is that if we were to take where we are today and we were to go back to a very, you know, even a relatively strict constitutional view and approach to our government, things would be so much better. Uh, because many of these agencies, they wouldn't exist. Or if they did exist, they would exist on a much smaller scale with much few, with with far fewer responsibilities and uh, far less authority. And, it, and we would actually see that they would just simply be stewards of what the what Congress would be doing rather than Congress saying, hey, OK, we have this department. This department now is responsible and and we're giving them latitude to determine policy. And we've seen that in the past with with various agencies. And, you know, we could spend all kind of time talking about specifics, um, you know, but we don't need to. So, you know, I, I think this is great. I enjoy like whenever I hear any politician and they say, you know, ending the Department of Education or if they just say, you know what, name a three letter agency, I'll probably agree to end it then I am like, you've got my attention for sure. Uh, and, and you get a lot of other, you, you, there, there will be a lot of other libertarians for whom their attention is grabbed as well. So kudos to you on that. Um, I want to 
look at some of your some of your issues on your website. So you say medical freedom and mandates. Um, so can you kind of explore that a little bit more? Um, you know, when you talk about medical freedom and mandates. Sure. Now, I do want to be clear. When I say medical freedom, I do not consider abortion a a medical situation. Uh, you okay. know, I I actually gave birth to my youngest in a car, and I will tell you now that if I could do it all over again, I would have done home births every single time. I think we've turned uh, something very natural and beautiful into something where we're supposed to be surrounded by sick people in hospitals, and and I think that it's part of that big complex we've got going on with pharmaceuticals and the medical industry, which I think COVID opened a lot of our eyes to what's going on there. But uh, yeah, I think that the coercion that went on, particularly with the COVID shot, should, if it didn't open the eyes of normies, as some might call them, then I don't know if anything else can open their eyes Mm -hmm. to what's going on there. But our healthcare industry has been hijacked. Our doctors aren't even able to make decisions for their patients unless they're making the right decisions according to the government. And something something's wrong there. So I feel like making decisions for your own personal body and your children is an absolute. You cannot have someone coming in and telling you that you need to put an experimental shot in your body or any shot for that matter. I mean, Mm -hmm. I always thought that people who were completely anti-vax, I was like, well, what are you, that doesn't seem, it seems like you're anti-science. And now I'm like, oh, well, since Dr. Fauci is science, maybe I'm anti-science too. But I, I, I do feel that mandates in particular are something so ridiculous because it's not even a law. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, they're just telling you you have to do this or else and it's you know what we're at the point where we need to say or else what or else what bring it on because if we don't stand up it is tyrannical if we don't stand up against it now do we think they're gonna not just take it a step further and a step further and a step further when you push you, you have to push back when they push you have to push back but i am fully for People being able to say no to any shot they want, even the military. I believe that even the military members who sign up shouldn't have to stand in that line that we've gotten so much pushback from people within the military community that did just take the shot. They said, oh, well, when you all go to boot camp, you know, you just get in a line and they just give you one shot after another and none of you complained then. Of course, I'm not active duty. I've never been in the military, but I'm I'm in the military community. So this is some of the stuff that they would hear back. And I don't believe that those people should end up having to stand in a line and take all these shots. If they don't want to take them, then don't take them. If you don't want them in the military, don't let them in the military. But I'll tell you what, the waivers that they're writing for everything else right now, mm-hmm. I don't think they, could, they couldn't They could stand to say no. They, they don't have the recruiting. They don't have the retaining. And at this point, they're allowing people to be on uh, hormones for trans after transgender surgery for the rest of their lives. They're allowing those people to stay in the military. So if they're going to start taking waivers and and doing all sorts of things for those people, then they should allot that to the other people in the military as well. Right. And when it comes to mandates, were there any mandates for which you said, you know what, maybe that one's okay? Or were you like, no on all of them? No, it's no on all of them. I okay. no. Okay. And and on, and just just to be clear for other people, when I say mandate, I mean something that comes with the force of government. Um, so now you may differ, and that's fine. Um, but I just want to make sure that my question specifically means, you know, a mandate from the government. You know, if my if my company had said, "Hey, look, in order to keep working here, you need to have this vaccine," I think that's uh, I, I think that I think there is a difference there. However, I will I will caveat that by saying. During COVID, there did not seem to the distinction seemed to be without difference um, because uh, there was so much government involvement in the first place. And, you know, and like I like you live here uh, in Jacksonville. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I noticed is that initially there were some companies that were like, hey, we're going to have a mask mandate. And other companies were like, no, we're not. And these were the ones that were permitted to be open. And I remember seeing online where people were making their choices they would say they would get together and say which grocery store is requiring a uh, you know or which store that's open is permitting or sorry permitting requiring a mask mandate 
And they said, well, this one, okay, well, let's not go there. Let's go to this one because they're not. And then, you know, and then we had it on the local level here, our mayor, you know, mayor Curry at the time, he came out and made a mask mandate for every, for everybody. And so that was just the way it was. And so then people weren't allowed to engage in free market activities as they had actually been doing. And so, you know, I, I can appreciate for sure anybody that opposes all of these mandates. And so I just wanted to make that, you know, that clear from my perspective. I know a lot of people differed and, and a lot of the difference does come because there was so much government involvement. Um, so uh, going further on that, um, it, well, sorry, I, I, I drew a blank on it. I'm, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank. Uh, I am pre-recording this, folks. And normally I'm on my A game, but there's been a lot going on today. So I do apologize. So we'll move on to uh, another topic here. So when you talk about investigations, so it's, it's on your site, you say, hey, investigations, all Americans have been led to believe that there are politicians committing crimes and that there's overwhelming evidence of such crimes. What kind of crimes are you talking about? Sure. I mean, it, it, it goes both ways. Mandates? No, it goes both ways. So I'm talking about we've all believed or we've all been led to believe by certain news media outlets that Trump has broken the law with X, Y, and Z. He had um, classified documents or, or mm -hmm. all sorts of things that they'll put out from one side and then they'll put out st stuff from the other side. Like we hear about Joe Biden um, in terms of money laundering in Ukraine. So mm -hmm. the, the two sides of the media will push so hard on what they want to have be believed as mainstream that we almost don't even know what to believe anymore because the media is supposed to be what tells us the truth about things and lets us decide the truth. The problem is, is the media is bought and paid for by whichever side they're owned by. You know, money comes on a leash and media is no exception to that. So if we actually have a president who had classified documents he wasn't supposed to have, then there should be an honest and true investigation into that. These are just examples, obviously. I'm just trying to come up with things that are well known. And if if Joe Biden's laundering money through Ukraine, then we need to have an actual investigation into that. The thing that I see happening is there's a whole lot of attention that's brought to the alleged wrongdoings of, of someone on the left or someone on the right, but there's never any outcome. There's never any accountability. And people always just think, oh, well, it went through the justice system if it's this or that, but we don't actually have a valid truth telling media to give us an outcome. So we mm -hmm. need, if there, if there are gonna be allegations thrown around like that, we need truth at the end of it. Now, I don't mm -hmm. care who it favors. I don't care if the Democrat ends up being the truth teller and the Republican ends up being the liar. I just want truth. So if we're mm -hmm. gonna have allegations flying around about all these illegal doings or, or what have you that is going on with our politicians, we need outcomes. We need the investigations to say, look, we looked into this and it turns out none of it's true or it's all true. And now this person's going to jail. We need real accountability and real investigations because right now it's just a game of good cop and bad cop. They just point mm -hmm. the finger at each other and they tell us what they're doing wrong. And it's all we all know for a fact. Well, how do we know for a fact? Why? Because the media says so. I don't trust the media. I don't trust the media on the left. I don't trust the media on the right. They're bought and paid for. So I want truth. I want investigations and I want to see an outcome of what is true and what is not true. Got it. Sounds good to me. As a libertarian, I'm all about transparency and, you know, wherever the cards land is where they land. Some days it'll be the Republican who is in hot water and other days it'll be the Democrat. And, you know, if we if we get enough libertarians elected someday, it may even be a libertarian who becomes in hot water. And, you know, you know, be that as it may, uh, you know, if you've done wrong, you need to be held accountable. So Absolutely. I, and I, I would just want to add to that. I actually saw a Facebook post I put up in 2016 where Marco Rubio was talking about leaks that happened, email leaks that happened. Mm -hmm. I think it was the DNC leaks 
with Bernie Sanders and Debbie Wasserman Schultz. I, I, I'm thinking that's what it was. But he made a statement specifically saying, you know, let's not be so harsh on these people because it's them today, but it could be us tomorrow. And I posted, this is back in 2016, I posted, if it's you lying to the American people tomorrow, then so be it. We're coming after you too. There is, this is not a red and blue or yellow gold, sorry, gold, right? Sure. Thing. This is a this is a thing about truth. So I, I've always felt this way. We need truth. So sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to. Kind oh of no ask. no no. Go right ahead. Okay. So I you know these are all good things. I like hearing these things. And you know again, I am the chair of the party, so I can't necessarily favor any particular candidate in this race since there's not a libertarian in the race. But I do want to make sure that to, to wish you well. And if you are elected, hopefully the things that I am hearing will come to fruition. Right. Like, like those are the kind of that's the kind of government that I expect to have. And that's the kind of government that I would uh, I would support, uh, you know, what for whatever limited government that I would support, um, you know, being us libertarians who are a bit ornery and, you know, on those kind of things. All right, any final words before we cut out of here? No, I mean, I, I think that it's important to understand above all, I believe in people above party. I believe in America above party. Mm -hmm. I am not loyal to a party. I am loyal to our country and to our people. Uh, I know you know, because we live in the same area and we know each mm -hmm. other and we socialize with the same people. I know you know I've supported libertarians in the past mm -hmm. as I found them to align or that particular libertarian to align with my principles more than the Republican did in the party right. that actually got me into a little bit of hot water, but I don't care because I did what was right. And, um, you know, I think libertarians are great people. I don't have the exact same ideologies, but you know, I went to pork fest last year, not this year because I've been busy campaigning. Oh, you but, went last year. I was yeah, not aware. You, I okay. thought, didn't I see you there? Right when um, RFK was oh, speaking. You, okay. Yeah. Um, that would, um, was that last year? I no, think that was, was this year. year. No, no, no you're right. Year. You're right. You're right. It was last year. I, I got a little confused because I've, oh, right. I, I, out of the last four years, I've went three. And so I think I went 21, 22, skipped 23, and then I went 24. So I think it would have been in 22 where RFK was there. You're right. I remember that now. I just got a little bit confused when you said um, last year all day for me yeah it's, but yeah that's so life. that's right yes you're right and you know what i will say this um one of my big criticisms of republicans and in and, and support for republicans beyond just the idea of party um and it's one of the reasons why i'm a, a libertarian today is that i feel like a lot of a lot of republicans and democrats as well will give lip service on the campaign trail then they get into office and things become different they become different they don't do the things that they say they were going to do or some in some cases they do almost the exact opposite and so today when i look at it you know when some of my party members are like well there's no libertarian running why don't you support this republican and you know beyond the fact that i'm a an officer in the party one of my criticisms is, well, I want to see a record first. I want a record that gives me some reason to support this particular candidate. Because if there's no record, then how do I know that my my support is not going to be misplaced? So I will give you credit because, you know, a moment ago you said, hey, I support libertarians sometimes to my own detriment. And you did. We had a candidate running for city council. You supported that particular candidate. And it did get you in hot water with the local Republicans, along with about, I don't know, like 18 other people. Right. And it was a big thing. It got reported in the media. It, you know, it wasn't some small potatoes thing. And, you know, it was significant. And so for me, I look at it and I say, that is a record of some sort. Like you haven't been elected to office. So I, I don't have a voting record to look at. But I do have a record of, you know what, when it mattered, uh, I can look back and say, you know what, this person, they did support a candidate outside of their party, and they did so publicly knowing that it might cause them problems, and it in fact did, and they held their ground. So I, I, will, I will give you that um, because that is not something I see very often from Republicans. And I will say this to any other Republican that might be watching, if you're looking for a libertarian vote, 
when there's not a libertarian candidate running. That's one way to prove that you're worth it, at least in my mind. So I just wanted you know give you a kudos for that um, because I can I I very much appreciate it. I know many other libertarians did as well. All right, so back to you. If you got any final words, I'm sorry. I, I we're, we're no, jumping you're back and forth here. You're good. You're. I never aspired to be a politician. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing this. I just happen to be a Republican. But mm -hmm. above all, God is my guide, and I believe in doing what's right and what's morally the right thing to do and is just, and then you have to have principles. So when I voted for Eric, I did so knowing and supported Eric in his campaign. Mm -hmm. I did so because Eric's ideologies and principles lined up better than the Republican. The Republican did not seem to be a conservative to me at all. And Eric, Eric is a good person and he actually has integrity. So that's why I supported Eric. And um, yeah, so no, you can follow me uh, on Twitter. I'm at, or should I say X, at Mara Macy. That's M-A-R-A-M-A-C-I-E. You can check out my website, www.maramacyforcongress.com. I like followers just as much as, and prayers, just as much as I like contributions and people putting my yard sign. Even, hey, you don't have to vote for me, if, but if you live in Duval and you're not part of, technically part of the Libertarian Party officially and you have good property, I'd appreciate it if you threw out my yard sign just to, so people see my name. You don't have to vote for me, I understand. But but if you have that kind of property, I'd appreciate that. And um, yeah, no, thanks for having me, DL. I'm sure I'll see you around. And mm -hmm. uh, it was great. Awesome. Well, thank you. Hold tight. I'm going to put you backstage, close out the show, and then we can chit chat a few minutes uh, after the show. Folks, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you found it informative and inspiring. And, um, you know, I just want to let you know, again, I will be reaching out to try to uh, get a hold of Mara's opponents just as a matter of honesty to make sure that there is no question in my, of my integrity with the party because I am an officer in the party. But again, thank you for watching. Hope you found it informative and inspiring. Make sure you go to maramacy.com. Be sure to catch me Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Eastern for an informed discussion on politics and culture. Also, make sure that you're subscribed to my YouTube channel, or if you prefer my Rumble channel, you can go to youtube.libertydad.com, or you can go to rumble.libertydad.com. While you're there, let me know how I'm doing by leaving a comment. Last but not least, I want you to remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people, and your product is liberty. I want you to have a great week. Catch you next time. But for now, I'm out.